has many of her publications and presentations, which all of us, you know, would really like to, you know, have a look always. It's a pleasure and profound honor for us, Professor Kim, to have you here with us to deliver uh, the 23rd annual lecture. I would just like to uh, mention to our participants in attending the conference that Delnet has been organizing the Delnet annual lectures since the year 1998, the year when we had uh, started off our very first national convention. So the 23rd national convention, we are you know, going to have very shortly the 23rd Delnet annual lecture. And in the past, I would just like to name a few of these annual lectures which were delivered in the past, in the year 2000, by Dr. V.S. Arunachalam, who was a distinguished service professor at the Robotics Institute, Carnegie Mellon University. In 2008, by uh, Mr. Stephen, Bram, uh, Stephen Abraham, the president of Special Libraries Association USA. In 2012, it was delivered by Mr. Brent May, the president of Special Libraries Association USA. In uh, 2018, it was uh, 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 delivered by Anjana Bhart, the university librarian from Florida G uh, Gulf Coast University. And also in last year, we had Dr. Camilla Elire, you know, who delivered the Dean Emeriti University of New Mexico and also the American Library Association's past president, who had delivered the 22nd. Great honor for us, you know, to have you here with us, a distinguished professional with a, a outstanding contributions, you know, that Professor Kim has made, and especially in the field of the emerging technologies. And that's the, you know, the main theme of National Convention on Knowledge Library and Information Networking, which Delhi has has been organizing uh, since yesterday and it's an honor and a great pleasure for me professor kim to request you and i as i said earlier that this is one of the most proud moments you know uh, to have you one of the 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 person you know who has contributed so immensely and working so closely on the emerging technologies to have you with us on this platform we remain ever grateful to you you know for your very very gracious acceptance of our and for your you know the time that uh, you are going to spare with us you know this evening thank you so very much professor kim and i request you now to kind of deliver the 23rd delnet annual lecture thank you very much Thank you so much. So I am very happy to be here uh, because on my computer, I cannot see any of you. I'm just looking at my slide. Uh, so it's a little <laughs> awkward, <laughs> but hopefully you can see me. <laughs> I am very excited to be here. I have meet all of you uh, in India and I'm in the United States. So um, it's uh, morning here, but I know it's in the evening, so I appreciate that you are spending time with me in the evening to talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, so while I'm talking, I'm going to actually turn on my webcam so that my computer won't get overheated, but when we go to the chat after I'm done, I will turn it back on. So uh, while I'm talking, you can just focus on my slides. So hopefully this will help uh, my computer a little bit. Uh, so let's begin with artificial intelligence. So I was asked to talk about artificial intelligence for libraries. Um, let me see. So artificial intelligence, as we know, has become a much discussed technology trend due to the recent remarkable advances it has made. And thanks to the mass media reporting on artificial intelligence on a regular basis, we now understand pretty well that the artificial intelligence technology will have a far reaching impact to almost every aspect of our lives from education to economy. Artificial intelligence is no longer a new term to librarians and information professionals. And unlike any other technology, AI brings out some of our deepest questions about what intelligence means and what the humanity is really about. And this is what is uniquely interesting about AI among all the other emerging technologies. So Max Techmark, a theoretical physicist at MIT and the president of the Future of AI Institute said, everything we love about civilization is a product of intelligence. So amplifying our human intelligence with artificial intelligence has the potential 
of helping civilization flourish like never before. As long as we manage to keep the technology beneficial. So even from this code, you can see that clearly there's some genuine concern about uh, this uh, powerful AI technology doing us potentially harm uh, more than good. So to get us started, let me ask you this relatively simple question. What comes to your mind when you hear artificial intelligence? Uh, so I cannot go through all the stuff right now, but I would like to encourage you to interact with one another through the chat window. So if you um, can type in what comes to your mind when you hear artificial intelligence, feel free to share that in the chat window with the other folks so that uh, you can all share that experience. So some people may say convenience, some people may uh, say we're gonna lose your job. So there will be many different um, responses, right? Um, and when we think about this, we'll also realize that we all have different ideas about what the world will look like when artificial intelligence is widely adopted. When AI becomes mainstream, what kind of world would we be living in? And how would artificial intelligence change uh, uh, our daily life uh, and our work? So give some thoughts uh, about these things. Um, now, some people will be excited about the potential of autonomous cars, for example. And artificial intelligence powered robots may relieve us from tedious mechanical labor, such as moving boxes, right? So AI can potentially bring us a lot of convenience. And this will be something we can be excited about in relation to AI. But some of us may worry that AI will make full surveillance a norm in everywhere we go. And this would leave us with no privacy. So already in China, face recognition is being heavily used to monitor people in public places for various reasons. And some of these, these things are becoming even more prevalent with you know, our new needs to curb the pandemic. So this concern of you know, extreme surveillance uh, has a legitimate ground. So there are two sides of artificial intelligence. We, of course, want the powerful artificial intelligence technology uh, to be ben benevolent and work for our good, um, but it may do us harm as well. So this is a scene that you're looking at uh, from a sci-fi TV show called Eureka. And the man on the left is Sherry Carter. Uh, and the man on the right is Deputy Sheriff Andy. And they are both sheriffs in the small town in the show, but Andy is actually an AI powered robot, but he looks just like a human sheriff because it's like a sci-fi show. And at least in the show, he successfully performs his job of protecting people in his town, um, even though he is a humanoid robot. But there is a worry that artificial intelligence may turn malicious. And such worry is also being turned into a plot of many sci-fi TV shows. And one of them is this British TV show called The Humans. Uh, if you are interested in artificial intelligence, um, this is, would be an interesting drama to watch. And I'm sure some of you have already watched that. So today I'm going to talk about uh, four uh, things uh, roughly. So what can today's AI do? How does AI work um, and some deep learning applications uh, powered by artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence for libraries. So let's begin with the simplest question. What is artificial intelligence? So one way to approach this question is to ask, what is the purpose of artificial intelligence? The purpose of artificial intelligence is to automate tasks that are usually performed by humans manually. However, the recent development 
in artificial intelligence has started to challenge our traditional notion of what a uniquely human task is, right? Many things that we used to consider to be uniquely human um, are now being performed by machines. And this is actually the goal of artificial intelligence, uh, that is to make something artificial intelligent, ideally as intelligent as a human being. So can today's artificial intelligence do things as intelligently as humans do? What can today's artificial intelligence do exactly? So as many of you know, back in 2016, AlphaGo, an artificial intelligence program created by DeepMind, won four out of five Go matches with the 80-time world champion Sadly in South Korea. So considering how complex Go playing is, this was an astonishing breakthrough in artificial intelligence. The original AlphaGo achieved this feat by learning from over 100,000 games played by human Go experts. Then just one year after, in 2017, AlphaGo Zero showed up, and this new AI program was developed using the reinforcement learning technique, and it defeated the original AlphaGo program by 100 games to none. Unlike AlphaGo, this new AlphaGo Zero learned how to play Go by playing millions of games by itself, and it started from scratch using random moves and learned by playing against itself. So how is this possible that a computer program beats a human being at a game, and then another computer program beating that computer program? And what is exactly artificial intelligence and how does it achieve this? While the public is still trying to gain a basic understanding about artificial intelligence, things in industries are moving at a much faster pace. So let's take artificial intelligence and natural language generation as an example. Natural language generation is a technology that turns data into a natural language, such as English and Hindi, and generates sentences and paragraphs for people to read and understand. The Washington Post, the USA Today, Reuters, BuzzFeed, and many other uh, media companies worldwide are experimenting news writing with AI technology. So, for example, Heliograph, the Washington Post's natural language generation application, produced the news stories about the Olympics and elections based upon the given narrative templates and a set of structured data provided. And with it, used by USA Today, create short news videos that condense news articles. And Bloomberg News produces as much as a third of the content that it publishes relying on its AI tool called the Cyborg. So Cyborg helps reporters produce thousands of articles on the quarterly earning reports of businesses. And these NLG applications were also used to create many news articles on baseball, football, and earthquakes at the Associated Press, Washington Post, and Los Angeles Times, respectively. So natural language generation uh, dramatically lowers the cost of content creation, and media companies can generate a much larger number of stories quickly in order to cater to many small audiences on local or niche topics. Another area where today's artificial intelligence is making an impressive progress is computer vision. Computer vision is a subfield of artificial intelligence that trains computers to interpret and understand the visual world. So Google Lens is a good example of how this computer vision is applied. So Google Lens is a set of vision-based uh, computing capabilities that allow a smartphone to understand what's going on in a photo, video, or live camera feed. And it can perform, as you can see here on the slide, real-time translation and object identification from the camera screen. It scans and translates the text, allows one to look up words, and events to one's calendar, call a number, or just copy and paste these words. 
Here you can see Google Lens identifying Tulip on the right and translating the menu and searching online reviews on a particular dish at a restaurant on the left. All done with just a smartphone and a Google app. You can also point the camera of a Google Lens compatible uh, smartphone to a popular landmark and find out historical facts as well as its hours and entrance fees and so on, as shown in the middle here. Uh, and of course, you can identify plants, animals, and things to buy because they want us to shop and buy stuff. And these are just a few examples of, you know, AI applications that are currently being used. And the AI technology is already being utilized in many applications and tools that we use on a daily basis, right? So these are assistants like Siri, recognize your words and answers you. And Alexa, let you shop online, schedule appointments and do many other things. Uh, Tesla's autopilot feature gives its car semi-autonomous driving and parking capabilities. Amazon, Netflix, and Pandora predict our preferences about what we might want to buy, watch, and listen to based upon our behavior. And Nest, uh, a Google subsidiary, predicts the heating and cooling needs and adjusts the temperature in your home or office so that you don't have to do it manually. But these recent explosive advancements in artificial intelligence led to much concern about the potential loss of jobs for people as well. So artificial intelligence does indeed have a potential to automate many human tasks. And right now, the machine's capacity for certain tasks uh, is quite limited in comparison to that of humans, but they are improving quickly. On the other hand, artificial intelligence is also creating many new jobs, particularly in data labeling. And this is because machine learning and particularly deep learning technique of artificial intelligence requires a large amount of labeled data, um, which are created by uh, humans. And this is in order to train AI algorithms so that they can perform successfully. So we'll talk about the mechanics of this uh, in a little bit. But to give an example of what data labeling is, imagine someone runs an image search in Google for things like Victorian sofa or farmhouse table, right? These are like referring to specific styles of sofa or table, right? And when you do this, internet search engines magically return many images that fit the particular description as if the search engine algorithm somehow understood their meaning. But this is not the case, right? So to make the seemingly instant and automatic performance of an AI algorithm possible behind the scenes, actually many people toil over numerous images of many different types of sofas and tables. And AI algorithms developed by supervised machine learning owes their accuracy to a huge amount of such training data fed into them, which have been put together by human workers. And there are also human workers behind the scenes monitoring and fixing errors in real time. So today, hundreds of thousands of people all around the world are working to meet this new demand for more and more correctly labeled data and for real-time error correction for AI services. And such work is the foundation and backbone of today's AI industry, even though it is often invisible to us. So it's only natural that we wonder how artificial intelligence exactly works under the hood to get all these impressive things done. But artificial intelligence is actually not new. And as a matter of fact, AI has been around since the 1950s. So in the beginning, in 1950, a British mathematician, Alan Turing, wrote a seminar paper that many of you would know called the Computing Machinery and uh, Intelligence, posing the question, can a computer think? And in 1955, John McCarthy, at the time a young professor at Dartmouth College in the United States, wrote a proposal for funding uh, to hold a summer conference on this very topic. And it was in that proposal that John McCarthy coined the term AI. And since then, artificial intelligence has been established as a new field of research. 
and artificial intelligence research seemed promising in the 1960s and then again drew much attention in the 1980s with the promise of an expert system. So an expert system is a computer system that mimics a human expert's uh, decision-making process. So it represents the traditional AI paradigm called the symbolic AI that has been around for a long time. And symbolic AI is rule-based. So in this symbolic AI paradigm, programmers input data and a large set of rules. And the machines, the computers apply those given rules to the input and produce the output. And this is how the past expert systems worked. And there is no surprise in here um, because traditional symbolic AI programs uh, are given the rules by us and we are the ones who make the rules. We know like how the rules work and why those are the rules. So machines in this case simply expedite what we humans already know how to do. Uh, so they were not really intelligent like humans are um, discovering and codifying rules because those were uniquely human tasks at the time. So how did artificial intelligence go from this symbolic AI paradigm to uh, something a lot more impressive that we see these days? So as you uh, would have guessed by now, symbolic AI is not the artificial intelligence paradigm that brought today's AI boom. What brought today's dramatic development in AI is called machine learning. So machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is bigger than machine learning. Uh, unlike in the symbolic artificial intelligence approach, in machine learning, programmers do not create and input a set of explicit rules into a machine. Instead, the programmers feed the machine with a large set of data and provide the, the expected output with some preliminary algorithm. And based upon that data and the expected output, a machine searches for a parent that ma best matches the expected output, starting with a preliminary algorithm. And then the machine refines the algorithm, right? And then this refined algorithm is equivalent to the rules that programmers were coding into an expert system in the past. And that refined algorithm is then used to predict the correct output for a new data set. And in machine learning, not humans, but machines are the ones that come up with those rules, those algorithms. And this is the most significant difference between the past symbolic AI approach and the new machine learning approach. And machine learning enables a machine to learn, not to simply follow given rules. So that's why this new approach is called machine learning because that enables a machine to learn unlike the previous symbolic AI paradigm. So it is to be noted that under the hood, machine learning uh, is all about numbers. Uh, different weights are assigned to a multitude of parameters in the hypothesis algorithm and deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. So you can see artificial intelligence is the biggest sort of um, term and then inside some of AI is machine learning and a subsection of machine learning is deep learning. So deep learning is a technique that enabled the most remarkable recent breakthroughs in artificial intelligence, such as face recognition uh, and AlphaGo's victory over the world champion of Go that I have mentioned earlier. So what is deep learning? Deep learning is a technique for implementing machine learning using a massive artificial neural network called the ANN for short. And it is called deep because it uses many hidden layers between the input layer and the output layer. And those layers can run from 10 to 100 or more. Through those layers, data is represented at multiple levels, eventually e enabling a machine to learn patterns that exist in unlabeled data. Deep learning, particularly unsupervised deep learning, is significant because it allows machines to learn from uh, data that is not hand-coded by humans, thereby making training the neural network much less costly and time-consuming. So let's take a look at some examples of deep learning. Andrew Ng 
uh, a former Stanford professor and the previous chief scientist at Baidu, China's biggest search engine company, led a project at Google Brain that built massive deep learning algorithms. And with a highly distributed neural network with over 1 billion parameters trained on 16,000 CPU cores, they were able to create a program that learned by itself to discover high-level concepts such as cats and people's faces from watching over 10 million unlabeled YouTube videos. So this kind of huge data set, uh, like 10 million YouTube videos, would have been unimaginable to accumulate before the times of the World Wide Web. And even if such a data set were available without the recent development in high performance computing, processing that much data like that uh, quickly through a neural network would have been impossible. These two, big data and high performance computing are the uh, main drivers of recent advancements in artificial intelligence. So right now, AI is a trend getting a lot of attention and much investment funding is being poured into this area. For this reason, we can expect even more results from artificial intelligence and a lot wider application and adoption in the near future. Now, uh, let's take a look at some uh, deep learning applications. So when you see Facebook automatically recognizing people's faces when you upload a photo, that's deep learning um, working behind the scene. And this deep learning facial recognition system is called the deep face. And it was uh, developed by Facebook in 2014. And this system consists of a nine layer neural net uh, with over 100, uh, 120 million connection weights. And it was trained on 4 million images uploaded by Facebook users. And Google Translate also got a huge performance boost when deep learning was introduced uh, into the system. So it didn't begin with uh, deep learning, but it incorporated that technique and its performance uh, improved uh, significantly. Google also released the Pixel Buds in late 2017, and uh, its real-time translation capability is also powered by uh, deep learning, and now it is available in all devices using Google Assistant feature. Digital assistants such as Apple Siri and Amazon Alexa are also powered by artificial intelligence, uh, particularly by a natural language uh, processing algorithm. Smart voice assistants let us use our devices with voice commands. And currently, they are used for relatively simple tasks, such as looking up something on the internet or getting information about the weather or current news and shopping, but they are getting smarter. So in 2018, Google unveiled the new AI-powered feature of Google Assistant called uh, Duplex. And Duplex enables Google Assistant to make a phone call to a restaurant and make a reservation or schedule an appointment on, on your behalf. Uh, so you can just make your phone do this rather than you yourself call a restaurant and make a reservation. So it's very convenient. It's also very impressive. Machines designed with the artificial intelligence technology are also being used in medicine to interpret CT scans and MRI images alongside the radiologists. This is sparking a controversy about whether artificial intelligence will eventually replace radiologists or not. AI programs are uh, quickly becoming commercialized as well. So there is already an AI program that designs a website for you via a chatbot that you can talk to. So we have so far taken a look at uh, what today's uh, artificial intelligence can do and how artificial intelligence works. And we have seen some examples of deep learning applications. Now let's uh, take a look at what artificial intelligence can do for libraries. What does all these recent developments in artificial intelligence mean to libraries and the information and knowledge industry? So here are some few areas where the 
information and knowledge industry will feel the greatest impact in my opinion. And the first one is abstracting and indexing. So with our artificial intelligence, abstracting and indexing will become more and more widely automated. Uh, no more abstract and keywords generated by humans as they are currently done uh, in the case of large databases, such as PubMed, which is a major uh, database of all the uh, medical literature in, in the United States, for example. Um, so this is PubMed and all of this metadata uh, indexing abstracts are generated by human indexers right now, but those processes can be taken over by artificial intelligence. And secondly, uh, information discovery and retrieval uh, also research insight. So there are multiple products already in the market that apply machine learning and deep learning techniques to improve processes in the information and knowledge sector. So Quartolio is um, one example of such product. It helps researchers with identifying, contextualizing, and generating research insights to bring efficiency to R&D activities. And some of you may have seen, you know, uh, is another uh, product that tries to improve the information discovery process by visualizing the search terms and their existing connections. So you can run this in your collections and you will find uh, concepts related e existing in your collection materials. And we are likely to see more products like that in the marketing going forward. Not just vendors, but libraries are also testing the water uh, with the artificial intelligence. So a few years ago, the MIT libraries applied machine learning to create a related thesis recommender. So if you have searched and read uh, thesis A, the recommender will check and see if, oh, you might be also interested in thesis B and C, would you like to check that as well? So it's very similar to like, you know, our online shopping experience. We have both this pair of shoes. Oh, you might want to take a look at this other pair of shoes because that's similar to what you have both, right? So things like that. So basically the um, way it works is similar. So this particular recommender is no longer in use at MIT libraries, but we can easily see the potential, right? And more uh, similar applications being developed in the future. Third, uh, feature detection and content extraction uh, from collections, library collections. So AI technology can be used to detect and extract features and content in the libraries or other institutional collections and document repository, which have not yet been revealed, right? So for example, what would it be like to have all the historical maps digitized? and then automatically get the geographical features in them detected, such as railroads or highways. This will allow historians to trace the changes in certain areas over time, right? Uh, so John Hessler, for example, a librarian at the Geography and Map Division of Library of Congress in, in the United States is working on a project to detecting railroads in historical maps housed in the Library of Congress collection. And he presented about this back in 2010. The AI technology can also be used to extract specific information from text materials. So law librarians are already discussing librarians changing role in law firms that started the early adoption of AI systems. Those systems automate some of the repetitive tasks in legal service work, such as scanning and predicting what documents will be relevant to a case, contract analysis, and lease abstraction. And lastly, uh, voice user interface and chatbot which are becoming increasingly popular. And AI-powered digital assistants can be used to provide information query and retrieval services for library patrons. So for example, Oklahoma University Libraries has started exploring the possibility of offering virtual reference services through Alexa for uh, their students. And a team of U librarians presented on this project uh, a few years ago. Um, 
And some of you know that Google has a project called the Talk to Books. This uh, website let you type in a question or a statement uh, or a statement and return. And then if you do that, it returns a response that is more likely to come next in a human conversation. Um, so in order to come up with this most appropriate response, what the program does is to look at every sentence in over 100,000 books, uh, all digitized, and the billions of lines of dialogues in those books. And this is how Google is trying to teach a computer how to make a conversation with humans uh, using machine learning. And the goal is to predict how likely one statement would follow another as a response in human conversation. So this is very close to the you know famous Turing test in this spirit, whether one can tell if you know uh, if uh, something is a machine or a human um, by speaking to it, and if you cannot tell that tell if that's a machine, uh, then it means that that machine is as, as intelligent as a human being. So here I'm asking like Google talk to books, uh, what is the best place to go on earth? And responses are not necessarily bad. Probably if I ask now, it will be already irrelevant because now we are in the pandemic, so we are not supposed to go anywhere, but this was a while back. And uh, back in uh, 2018, uh, a Vermont librarian, Jessamine West asked Google talk to books if, like a little more tricky question. So she asked like, oh, women are women smarter than men? And as you can see, uh, it did not go very well because they were actually referring to sources uh, that are not you know, accurate in, uh, in fact. So she submitted the feedback uh, to improve the response as you can see. So she uh, gave Google feedback that this basically gets the answer from like Daily Mail headline, which is inside of one of the, you know, bibliographies in the book. And this is not a fact that the book is asserting it is your bot getting some kind of like clickbait. So there is a limitation, but it gives you a glimpse of, you know, how these things are unfolding and the companies and institutions are trying to make use of this AI technology to try something new and uh, more powerful. Uh, for convenience and other, you know, automation-related uh, purposes. So this raises a very interesting question for us. How can libraries, content providers, information system vendors make it easier for artificial intelligence power tools to accurately ingest, process, and evaluate the content and metadata? Because obviously we do not want to make our system to have errors like what we have just seen in Google's talk to books. So in the future, more intelligent uh, machines, that is artificial intelligence tools, will directly interact with information content and service. And people's access to information content and services is likely to be more and more mediated by those AI powered programs and you know, voice user interfaces online rather than taking place in person and on site at a physical library. So that's what I have. And that having been said, now I would like to open the floor for any questions that you may have. I would also be very happy to hear what your thoughts are about artificial intelligence in the context of Indian libraries, because I do not know a lot about Indian libraries and I'm sure there are many differences between here and there. So I would love to hear your thoughts and any questions that I can answer. I have also put uh, this information about my recent book that came out only this year. This book includes information not just about artificial intelligence, but other related topics like big data, uh, internet of things, uh, blockchain, uh, platform businesses, synthetic biology. So I thought some of you may want to check it out. And, and if you also have any other um, questions uh, related to this topic, you can find me online. So I put some links here and I'll, I'll 
share the slides with the organizers later so you will have this information so feel free to ask me questions we have i think 10 10 15 minutes yes, yes professor ken thank you so very much for such a wonderful you know scintillating uh, talk on the AI for libraries and I think uh, our uh, attendees would definitely be our invited speakers and attendees would like to ask you many questions. In fact, we, we have uh, with us uh, Shablia in a 12 minutes, uh, 15 minutes, you know, we do have uh, with us. I uh, We are just making the floor open enough. Can we see you now, Professor Kim? Uh, is it possible to see you now? Yes, yeah, it's thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you indeed for such a wonderful talk, you know, on AI and definitely it has been an eye opener for many of uh, the professionals here, uh, the way the world is moving towards AI and uh, we are just uh, keeping the floor now open. Uh, if you want to ask a question, we request you please kindly raise your hand so that we can give you an audio control. We are just, uh, yes, uh, we have Mr. H.R. Mohan. Uh, Mr. H.R. Mohan, please, uh, before you pose a question, it would be really good, like, if you can introduce yourself to Professor Boyun Kim so that she knows your background and the context of the, you know, your question. Uh, Mr. Mohan, I have give, uh, unmuted you, and you may kindly ask the question and introduce yourself, please. Okay. Uh, good evening, Professor. It was a wonderful uh presentation about AI in libraries. Uh, I would like to introduce myself. I am Mohan, uh, past president of Computer Society of India, and I was with the newspaper, The Hindu, as the associate vice president of systems. Uh, I had the opportunity of involving myself with the library automation and indexing and digitization uh, areas of uh, the newspaper, which is about 140 plus years old. My question is more in terms of uh, when you archive a lot of uh, historical uh, uh, data or the news items, how to find uh, the relevancy? The recall is very high, but the relevancy becomes an uh, uh, issue. See, many of the uh, conventional uh, search techniques, you know, they provide a high uh, recall, but the relevancy is becoming an issue when you try to uh, retrieve information. That is one, one part. And second thing is the country like India is having a multilingual uh, 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 information. So how AI can help in uh, translating this multilingual uh, information into a central database, which can be accessed by people from uh, different regions. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, so those are both very excellent questions. Uh, as you can imagine, I do not have like solutions for those problems because those are problems that are being actively worked on, on uh, currently by many uh, experts. Uh, so how to improve the relevancy um, in, uh, in this case, I think, you have in mind the texture data um, and I think that is more so like the problem that we are considering in libraries uh, and information and knowledge industry is more complex because when we say relevant it depends on <clears throat> the question that we have so any library patron or researcher or a scholar uh, has a very specific topic in mind and based upon that topic, something counts as relevant or not. So there is a frame of reference that sort of determines the relevance. And this is not necessarily expressed fully in search terms, right? So we are, we somehow we have to sort of suss out that frame of reference from like just to, you know, a number of search terms. So, so that's a very uh, daunting task. It is a lot more complex than what uh, we uh, think it would be. Uh, that having been said, I think having a lot more data and more algorithms that 
Lalo, train based upon uh, data will help. So the more data you have, the more data you can feed into algorithm, you can be trained to become more accurate. So in machine learning and deep learning, quantity actually brings up the quality. So I think that's how this will unfold. And about the second part of question about making uh, information in multiple languages, that's also a really thorny problem because languages do not categorize and refer to things exactly in the same way across different languages. So like Hindi categorizes certain things in a certain way, English does it another way, Korean does it differently, and I don't know, like French does it another way. They do not all match one-to-one, -one, right? Uh, so there are rough rough correspondences, but not 100%. So, but with artificial intelligence, there is so much improvement in translation. Uh, in general, I think we will have more improvement in on this front as well, and that's going to make a big difference. So a lot of research libraries across the world, I'm sure it is the case in India, uh, here in the States and other places, researchers and scholars have needs for searching and identifying research materials written in different languages. And uh, looking for those original sources in different languages in one library catalog has been always a challenge. Um, uh, uh, for for librarians and you know library professionals to to bring, uh, so that is going to be improved as AI's capacities in natural language processing and um, and improves. So, so that is something that I can uh, give you as information, and it is being currently worked on. Uh, but it is ongoing ongoing uh, topics of investigation. Thank you very much, Professor Kim. We have another, you know, a uh, few queries like, you know, uh, some of the participants would like to know, since you are closely, you are an expert in that, the use of blockchain technology and IoT in libraries. What is your take on that? You know, the IoT and blockchain technologies, how oh, we can, you know, how the blockchain and IoT, how these two technologies, emerging technologies can play wonders in the libraries. For libraries? Um, exactly. Yeah, so there, I, I think there, there is, there are some writings that I have uh, written and presentations that I have given on this particular topic. So I would recommend because it's like a, it's a completely different topic. So different I topic, would, exactly. Yeah, so I would recommend that you, <laughs> if you are interested in this topic a lot, uh, like the links in my last slides, uh, that will give you some information about blockchain. So I would recommend checking that out, but very quickly. Uh -huh. blockchain uh, can be potentially used uh, for libraries for secure transaction, but uh, the overhead would be very high because of the way blockchain works, it requires a lot of computing resources. So in order for libraries to uh, use blockchain, uh, for certain purposes, you need to make sure that that's a worthwhile investment. So if the security is a really uh, paramount concern that would justify that much uh, computing resources, then that would be okay. Now coming up with that kind of uh, particular um, particular use case would be a challenge for libraries. but in terms of guaranteeing the validity of certain library content that we want to pre preserve for posterity because it's very important. And for some reason, whatever, whether it is political or something else, this is very likely to be damaged in some way or somehow it can be distorted and there is a real risk of losing the correct content. Like imagine that kind of case for libraries and it is our utmost concern to keep this content correct the way it is right now without any changes made like for posterity for really long time and guarantee that that accuracy uh if that is your concern then blockchain can be one of the technologies that provides that because you can you can actually make sure that that is not tempered so i hope that helps that blockchain yep. Uh, can be useful for that kind of purposes. Internet of Things uh, is that's 
a lot of times in the library context, you will be using microsensors to um, make the library operation or services more efficient. Uh, so it would be um, relevant if you are looking at improving library services or library operations by implementing a lot of IoT capable devices or elements in your building or any systems. So that's probably the best I can do within the limited yeah, sure. time that we have. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. if you are more interested, uh, feel free to go ahead and explore. There is a lot of literature written about that topic as well. Fine. Professor Kim, I have a question for you. And the question is, there's a growing concern nowadays that the AI recommendation recommendations are fairly biased in nature and it does affect the decision making so how do we ensure this uh, ai risk management you know what kind of uh, design planning we do in the ai systems you know to ensure because after all we are dealing with an artificial intelligence and it does lead to a biased decision making you know how do we uh, how do you see that this scenario will be taken care of uh, by the technology experts the risk yeah. management you know yeah yeah, so that, that's a really good question. So as I have explained, uh, today's artificial intelligence makes uh, a lot of use of machine learning and machine learning is driven by data. And this data is not just any data, raw data available. We have a lot of information in the world, but a lot of it is still in the analog form, right? Only a fraction of it is digitized and available for computers to ingest and make sense, right? Um, so it should be that kind of data. Uh, so there is a very little fraction of data that can be actually used for machine learning and deep learning purposes. And even that data, among those data, they are not all used for these purposes because not all data is available publicly, right? And AI researchers, for them, the easiest way to obtain large amount of data because they need a lot of data to uh, train AI algorithm is to get anything that is available public and ideally for free, right? So if you think about this, then the data that is used to train uh, machine learning algorithms is very limited in scope and nature. That's not, you know, an objective sample of all the data available for whatever that they are trying to um, create AI algorithm for. So the biases or whatever, uh, you know, limitations uh, in those algorithms trained by a limited amount of data in number of ways, not just in quantitative, also quality in many different aspects uh, is, is un unavoidable. But being aware of that limitation is the first step towards mitigating the, the issues uh, in biased decision making, right? So knowing that the AI, AI algorithms, whatever recommendations that, that come out of artificial intelligence itself can have flaws, that's the first mm -hmm. step, right? You are aware of that, that that's not perfect. The second step in mitigating the harmful consequences of, uh, you know, biased decision making is making sure that the data you use for training is um, as, uh, uh, like from a wide variety as much as possible, right? So, for example, if it is for, I don't know, like radiology purposes, does it does the data include the data from all the people, not just men, not just women, not just the people from like in their 20s and 30s, right? If people's data are excluded from that, if you don't have any children's data, you can use the uh, decision made from that algorithm to predict what would be the best for children because you did not feed that data, right? If you haven't included any people from, I don't know, like particular ethnicity, if you only use the white people as the you know data source, then you cannot probably use that information directly towards uh, you know, people of color, right? Because it's not gonna be exactly matched. So that's another thing is uh, uh, making the data that is used for algorithm training uh, to be uh, a wide variety and cover as many groups as possible. Uh, and uh, also 
making sure that people who develop these AI algorithms are from various backgrounds so that they can raise these questions earlier when they develop AI applications. That's another important component um, because if the people who develop these things do not even know, like are not even aware of other people's perspectives, they cannot possibly think of even considering that, right? So having various perspectives is also important. And then of course, various institutions, organizations, the government can have uh, particular regulation practices to make sure that these algorithms are used for what purposes, how they were created, and whether they are meeting uh, certain you know, criteria. So there can be various ways to audit. There can be ways to test to see if there are any edge cases where the algorithm fails. Uh, so these are all the steps that you can implement in order to, you know, mitigate some of the harmful consequences of uh, biased decision making when we rely too much about artificial intelligence algorithms. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kim, for your time. It was indeed such a wonderful pleasure for us, you know, to, for the entire uh, community of Indian Library and Information Science professionals who are a part of Rackling 2020 to have your very expert views, giving us an insights into these disruptive technologies. And would, uh, there are a lot many questions coming in, but because of Posity, and I think uh, we would uh, share your email ID with them. And in case if they want to write to you, because many of them would like to really read your book, Moving Forward with Digital Disruption, we are able to see it in the chat box. They're asking us like, you know, uh, what's the complete title and it's very much there now on the screens so they can do that. Thank you indeed a lot, you know, for your very, very uh, uh, wonderful presentation and uh, special thanks, you know, for taking out time, you know, from your very, very busy schedule. I know that you have been traveling a lot, but you, you were very, very kind and gracious and, uh, you know, taking out time for us, responding to the mails and making it possible for us to have this, uh, you know, annual lecture delivered by you. We would be, we would like to send you a plaque of honor from Delnet and uh, I just want to know from you whether we have the postal deliveries happening there, you know, because we would like to send that. It would be uh, from India, a uh, plaque of honor from Delnet to you for delivering our uh, 23rd uh, annual lecture. So we do have, I hope that it's not virtual now, you know, we would be able to do so, you know, it, it would be a great honor for us to do that. Sure, absolutely. Was, yeah, yeah. Thank you so very much. We are going to cherish, you know, uh, this uh, lecture forever. And uh, thank you so very much for being so supportive. And that's like bringing, you know, the uh, uh, the humanity together, you know, in the spirit of crisis. And you have been really, really, you know, truly of very great support to us, which we truly uh, value, highly value. God bless you from all uh, the professionals here from the country and from our participants, and especially from Dylan, a very warm, sincere gratitude to you for you know giving us a wonderful opportunity to listen to you. Thank you Thank so you very much, Professor Kim. Have a great, uh, great conference over the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so very much. If you have some time, I, I know that you would be occupied with your work like it's a, you know, it's a working day for you. But if you have some time, we have a wonderful cultural evening, which is getting started in a moment, which will give you a little glimpse. If you even five, 10 minutes of yours, wherein we are going to have a puppet show, you know, and also the Rajasthan is a very vibrant, you know, state in India, very colorful kind of a thing little time if you can devote on that like you know can be there with us in that because you know to give you a little more picture of the Indian culture <laughs> will be more than happy yeah. yeah I would love to I just have another <laughs> meeting that I have to run to okay, yeah, I know that I know that I know that I'm very yeah, well someday I'll be able yeah, to yeah, make yeah. Yeah, 